Thank you very much. That's a lovely introduction. I'm tired just listening to that. What a great guy I am. <laughs> I've done so much. I need to sit down. Um, it's really nice to be here. And uh, having, of course, having been in the entertainment industry, I've spent a fair amount of time working in restaurants. So I'd just like to thank the staff of the hotel <laughs> for a wonderful lunch. If you do that, you get bonus points, and they send you home with dessert. <clears throat> So here we go, good afternoon. My name is Timothy Murphy, and I've been invited here today to share with you my perspective as one of my mother's caregivers. My siblings and I are presently on a journey with our mother as together we all navigate the increasingly treacherous waters of my mother's dementia, more specifically, Alzheimer's disease. I'm the youngest of five children, and even my brothers and sisters will tell you it's true when I say that I am my mother's favorite. My mother was a housewife of the late 1950s. She had four children under the age of five and a husband with a demanding career as a lawyer and politician. So she didn't have a lot of time to spend with each child individually until I came along. I was born a full four years after my sister Michaela, so I got to stay home alone with my mother while the other four spent their days in school. My mother doesn't love me any more than she does my siblings, but. Those four years I had at home alone with her did create an undeniably unique bond between us. Let me tell you a little bit about Dorothy Murphy. She was born Dorothy Ann Jenkins in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. She was the youngest of four children herself and was also the spoiled baby of the family. Her father was local jeweler Lloyd Jenkins and his wife Margaret. In high school, my mother adopted the nickname Dot, it had always bothered her that people tended to drop the second O in Dorothy. Instead, they called her Dorothy, or Dorothy Ann. She hated that, Dorothy Ann. She hated that, so Dot it was. She married my father, Terry, when she was 21, and he was 25 years old and a hotshot, up-and-coming lawyer. Interestingly enough, I never heard my father call my mother Dot when he spoke to her. You see, he always put the second O in Dorothy. And she loved him, and he loved her. So Dot and Terry raised five kids, and she was the perfect mother and the ideal wife. Nobody didn't like Dot Murphy. Smart, funny, beautiful, down-to-earth, talented, and dedicated to her family. She was the ideal politician's wife. When Pierre Trudeau became prime minister and was Canada's most eligible bachelor, he chose my mother as his first dance partner at the Parliamentary Ball in 1968 which landed her on the front page of the Toronto Star. As a side note, she thought for sure he was gonna choose Inga Good because she had bigger boobs. <laughs> <laughs> My mother still has the dried rose Pierre gave her from his lapel. She was also introduced to Queen Elizabeth at Buckingham Palace because my father was the chairman of the North Atlantic Assembly for NATO. She and my father had a private audience with Pope Paul VI, and she was never more comfortable than when she was sitting around a bonfire with her banjo and her auto harp. My father had serious health issues later in his later years, and my mom nursed him through a blood clot in his carotid artery, a bout with cancer, which he survived, two brain surgeries, cataract surgery, and after making it through all of that, he lost his eyesight to macular degeneration. But my father never complained, and neither did my mother. My father's final battle was, battle was with esophageal cancer, and he didn't win that one. He passed away six years ago, and my mother held us together. She was determined to make my father proud by soldiering on and celebrating what we had, not what we had lost. She set the bar for all of us. My mother continued to live on her own in their home, and nothing slowed her down. She was 81 years old, still driving, cooking, cleaning, volunteering, making stained glass, gardening, shoveling, socializing, and the only medication she took was one pill for bone density. And then she started repeating herself. Now, it was normal for mom to occasionally repeat a story because, well, think about it. She had five kids that she was constantly in contact with on the telephone, so how are you supposed to remember who you told what to? But when she started repeating the same story in the same conversation, that was new, and it scared the hell out of me. So naturally, I didn't bring it up. 
When it did eventually surface in sibling conversations, I admitted I had noticed it too. But it was just old age. It happens to everybody, right? Sticky notes. Sticky notes and her day timer. I think those were the next indicators. Reading the sticky notes that were stuck to the kitchen counter to remind her about things gave us some insight into the struggle she was having with her memory. And the notations in her day timer started to look frustrated. Things were underlined as if to say, remember this. It didn't take us long to realize that this wasn't just old age. And this didn't happen to everyone. This was different and we needed an assessment. When her doctor tested my mother's cognitive abilities for the first time, my mother scored only one point higher than the score which calls for a driver's license to be revoked. The doctor recommended my mother stop driving right then. My mother has great respect for and faith in the medical profession. I think in part due to her upbringing and partly because she and my father had great friends in the medical profession and certainly because of the experience of being my father's caregiver uh, and the interaction she had with his many doctors. So fortunately for us, mom knew she had to trust her doctor and handed her keys to her precious Toyota RAV over to my sister. I'm not gonna lie and say that was that because we were regularly reminded what a pain in the ass it was for her to have to call us to get a ride somewhere and that she couldn't drive herself around anymore. Still, despite her resentment over the driver's license situation, my siblings and I discovered because the doctor said so is an invaluable tool when advocating that our mother heed advice. <laughs> Although the first suspicion was that my mother's condition might be vascular, Upon further examination, the diagnosis was that she was in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. I am blessed with three remarkable sisters who, believe it or not, are even more remarkable daughters. And they set about doing their homework on Alzheimer's. My sister Mary Lynn was the one who contacted the Alzheimer's Society. She informed me and my other sister who lives in Sault Ste. Marie about a learning series offered over the course of five weeks that was starting up, which we could attend and that further education and continued support were also available through ongoing caregiver support groups. I decided immediately I was going to accompany my sisters to those five learning sessions. I knew enough about Alzheimer's disease to know that I didn't know enough about Alzheimer's. So I also knew that I couldn't be in denial about this and I figured walking through the doors of the Alzheimer's Society would be like an admission of the truth. You see, I played the, I'm the baby of the family and I don't deal well with grown up situations card when my father was dying. I'm not proud of that. My sisters were kind and they excused my behavior and tried to ease my guilt by comforting me, saying things like, dad knows you love him. We all deal with things in our own way. Not everybody is cut out for work on the front line. <laughs> so, <laughs> some nurses in the room. <laughs> so while my other siblings and my mother learned to change my father's feeding tube and clean it, oh my God, what is with those feeding tubes and the cleaning? My poor mother had a breakdown every time she had to clean that feeding tube. So they're doing that and I just breeze in and make them smile and cheer them up and you know, give them the details of my fascinating life and leave the dirty work to the big kids. But I knew this time I had to step up because after all, my mother and I did have that undeniably unique bond. The learning series at the Alzheimer's Society was life altering. We got to meet other people who were going through what we were going through and some who were further along in their journey and empathy provided strange comfort. We learned about the science of the disease so it somehow became more tangible to us. We got to hear from people with lived experience who shared their stories on video and in person and gave us a glimpse into what might be our future. We witnessed the tragedy of Alzheimer's disease, but we also witnessed the wonder of it. When you prepare a caregiver, both intellectually and emotionally like that, when you educate them, when you strategize with them, when you provide them with the mental health tools and community resources, you empower them. Every time I left one of those sessions, it seemed like a shadow was being cast off of Alzheimer's disease. It wasn't any prettier in the light, 
but at least I could see what I was dealing with. Ignorance brings fear. Knowledge brings power. I was less afraid and less alone, and I was forming a new bond with my sisters. Meanwhile, my mother had created quite an environment for herself in her home. She had a routine, and she was good at it. She was as self-sufficient as someone who couldn't remember what day it was could be. The sticky notes were beginning to multiply and were often all bearing the same reminders. She was re writing reminders now in her day timer and, and even in the journal that we were using to communicate with each other. Uh, we noticed that her hair wasn't always done, that sometimes she would wear the same slacks and blouse for multiple consecutive days, and that she wasn't wearing her earrings anymore. The daughter of a jeweler, my mother always wore her earrings. We began to schedule ourselves with at least once daily visits to my mother's house, and my sister Mary Lynn stayed overnight once weekly as well. We made sure that mom was eating three meals a day, and we did our best to keep her safe and happy and reassured. But it wasn't long before we recognized that mom had lost confidence in herself. We could sense her growing anxiety, her frustration, and her fear. We knew we had reached the point when mom was going to need more supervision than we alone could provide. Once again, my sisters were on top of things when it came to power of attorney and finances and all the legalities that go along with that aspect of being a caregiver. The Alzheimer's Society and CCAC also provided us with information to guide us through this next set of preparations. It was time for more assessments and time for us to investigate our options for in-home care or, if necessary, consider moving mom out of the house. Pardon my French, but this shit was getting real. My sisters made appointments to view an assisted living home. I went with them. We loved it. We all agreed that if there were ever any moment of opportunity to introduce the concept of moving into an assisted living apartment into a conversation with mom, we would take advantage of that. Funny how those opportunities seldom present themselves, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the five siblings became email enthusiasts and we corresponded and shared information regularly with our brother in British Columbia and with our sister who lives here in Toronto. We had family meetings and conference calls. We shared our fears and we cried together. We shared our strengths and we laughed together. Uh, and we, through it all, we shared our love. Love for each other. But most importantly, love for my mother. There were many occasions when we referenced material we had been given by the Alzheimer's Society, or times we recalled things we'd learned in those five sessions. We got our ducks in a row and made a list of phone calls to make and questions to ask, and then fate intervened. In October of last year, my mother was taken to the hospital with a terrible pain that ran from her foot to her knee. She was in so much pain that she cried. My mother does not cry easily. We really, we have learned so much in the past five months about dementia. First of all, we learned that when you ask someone with dementia the question, on a scale of one to ten, with one being no pain at all and ten being the worst pain you ever had, <laughs> you know the rest? You might as well be asking her what day it is, because she doesn't know the answer to either one of those questions. And when you ask that question, what is your pain? When you ask that of a very sweet woman, who's carrying around 83 years of Catholic guilt <laughs> and who doesn't want to bother anyone and who has dementia, be prepared that the answer isn't going to be altogether accurate. So when my mother downplayed her discomfort, the triage nurse took her at her word and even though my sister had told her my mother was in the early stages of Alzheimer's, they were sent to the walk-in clinic for two hours. When the agony became unbearable, they were redirected back to emergency, where they finally saw a physician. <clears throat> it ended up that that very night, my mother had to have arthros arthroscopic surgery on her knee. Um, what do you call the one that they give you, the, the twilight? To not, not, they don't knock you right out? Yeah, there's a little, word, I don't know, that's what they gave her. So they didn't have to knock her right out, which was good, because when she was down here for, uh, she had to have all kinds of stuff done with her uterus and her rectum and everything and they, they gave her they knocked her right out 
and then her kidneys wouldn't start again after that stuff, and it was, it was really bad. So we were really happy that it was just going to be a light sedation. Okay, so <clears throat> turns out, well, the initial concern was that it was a blood infection in her leg. Um, but then when the doctor went to stick a, a, the needle into her knee to get the fluid out, he said, I can't even get the needle in there. You have arthritis. We all looked at each other and said, no, there's no, she doesn't have arthritis. She kneels, she gardens, she does stairs. There's no arthritis. That's what it was. It turns out um, she had a cal the calcium pyrophosphate deposition. They call that pseudo-gout was another name for it, right? And that was the pain that she was having. So anyway, they went in there with the arthroscopic stuff and they cleaned it all as much as they could, but this is where she's at now with the, with the arthritic knee. My family knew from previous experience that my mother does not react well to painkillers. For instance, it's well known among us that my mother has no tolerance for Tylenol-3. Um, whenever she'd been given it in the past, it made her wired for sound, and to use my mother's terminology, completely loopy. <laughs> so. For three solid days after her surgery, while receiving post-surgery pain medication of Dilaudid, my mother didn't sleep. Three days, no sleep. She became completely delirious, and we were informed by hospital staff that unless we provided round-the-clock bedside care, my mother would need to be physically restrained to protect herself. So we made sure that mom was never alone. On the third day after her surgery, I was on the morning shift, when she turned violent. I was alone with my mother when she became determined to get out of her hospital bed. I was not prepared for her physical strength when I tried to restrain her. And I was literally stunned when she made fists and began punching me in the stomach. Then she slapped me. I was trying to hold her and simultaneously reach the call button on the other side of the bed. Um, and so I, I was maneuvering to get the call button. I still had one arm wrapped around her breastbone, but she managed to slide down and get her legs over the edge of the bed and got her knee stuck between the bed rail and the mattress. So I was holding her from behind as she's punching me in the head when the nurses arrived. Now, what's interesting now is I tell my mother this story now, and she thinks it's the funniest thing ever. <laughs> I did that? Oh. At the time, I was, what, what the, uh, <laughs> so then these nurses came in, and um, we have some people from the Sioux here, hello. <laughs> it was a big, tall, and he was a, a black nurse. He was lovely, but oh boy, oh boy, did she give him hell. He came in with another nurse, so the two nurses came in, and um, I, then they pulled this blanket out from under her, and they were trying to get her unstuck, and the blanket was all bloody. And I thought, oh my God, I yanked her catheter out, and now I've damaged her hoo-hoo again. <laughs> I told you earlier, she had to have all kinds of, you know, stuff for her Yeah, she blamed me. <laughs> I was the youngest of five. I was the last one out. I slammed the door too hard. So it turns out the blood actually was from the incision. She smashed her knee on the rail and had opened. They're only the little ar ar arthroscopic incisions, but still, they bleed, man. So I saw this bloody blanket, and I'm freaking out. I was horrified. As she bumped the incision. It was not serious, but it scared the heck out of me. The nurses, as sweet as they were, they terrified her because she was just she was so out of it, she, she, and she became absolutely feral. I mean, she screamed like a banshee, and she was striking out at the nurses too. So I tried a new tack. And I lowered my voice to attempt to sound authoritative. And uh, I tried to sound like my father. So, I mean, she'd just seen him earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Along with a whole cast of other dearly departed relatives. <laughs> oh, look, there's Aunt Mamie. She must be working here at the hospital now. What? <laughs> so anyway, I thought, what the heck? I'll try it. So I said, Dorothy? <laughs> Two O's. Dorothy, we do not hit people. She stopped. <laughs> and then she snapped at me, then don't push me. <laughs> but she did stop fighting. So her knee was still stuck. The nurses finally said the only way to do this is to take her out sideways and put her in a chair. With all the wires to the everything. Anyway, I told the nurses I had to step outside. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm breathing into my mic. Now that she was safe, I needed to release my emotions. So I went to the hallway. I had a little meltdown. And I called my sister Karen for backup. And I wondered how people who didn't have the support system that our family has managed to get through ordeals like this. And that question has been on every one of our minds in my family 
from that day forward. Five kids. My brother flew home from British Columbia. We sat 24 hours around the clock for six days in that hospital. How could someone do? You could never. If you were an only child, what is just boggles the mind. I don't know how people do it. Anyway, then while I'm out there having my meltdown talk in the Karen, I hear, I hear my mother again. Get your hands off of me. Who do you think you are? So I thought, I better get back in there and give them some support. So the nurses, they were very kind, and they did manage to get my mother into a chair, but they were asking her questions that I knew that she couldn't comprehend and that she was incapable of answering in her current mental and emotional state. They decided to try to administer her pills in applesauce and asked mom if she wanted to hold the spoon herself. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she didn't even know what a spoon was at that moment. She didn't answer, so the male nurse, he tried to feed it to her. No, she wouldn't open up. So then he gave her the spoon herself. And then he wore the applesauce. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and this is when, and please, please do not take any offense, but I did wonder at that moment, how much training do nurses get when it comes to dealing with this kind of a situation, like this was, I don't know. And how can you train a nurse for everything? I know you can't, and you just got to go through it and live it. But man, I don't know. I just, I wondered, do these two poor nurses know what they've gotten themselves into with this woman? So anyway, I just sort of sat there shaking my head. I was at my wit's end, but only for the moment. And that was a huge lesson, actually, throughout this entire adventure. This is something we've learned. What we are facing here are a series of moments. And our goal is to deal with each moment as they present themselves. I'm telling you right now, if I had not attended those information sessions at the Alzheimer's Society, I don't know how I would have coped with my mother assaulting me and the things that she said to me afterward out of her fear and anger and confusion. But I was equipped. And although it came at me fast and furious and way sooner than any of us anticipated. I was able to take it for what it was and not end up emotionally devastated. Unfortunately, the next medication prescribed for my mother to reduce her agitation was Ativan. All that did was keep her awake for another day and a half and exacerbated her hyperactivity and her sleeplessness. Now, eventually, my mother's doctor, who does not have hospital privileges, happened to be in the hospital, and there was some consultation. And I'm sorry I don't have the details of this, but there was another medication they finally found, and my mother slept for two days. <gasps> All right. So my mother's surgery and subsequent hospital stay led to a far more rapid progression of her dementia than any of us were prepared for. Over the course of the next five weeks while she was in the hospital, and she, fa she bravely fought her way back physically, mentally, and emotionally, she obviously was not returning to her previously semi-independent state. This was a whole new ballgame. Mom going back home from the hospital to live, in her own, to live in her own house, even with assistance, had become an unrealistic scenario. Even assisted living in that lovely retirement home had been taken off the table as an option for our mother's future. We were faced with the reality, the harsh reality, that our mother needed 24-hour care in a nursing home. The system got trickier to navigate at this point, or maybe it just seemed trickier because we were in the midst of it and we were getting information from so many factions. The doctors and nurses, the physiotherapists, CCAC, discharge staff. Was she going to be moved to a room on the second floor for rehab? Was she going to have to move to a temporary residence for convalescent care? Who was assessing what and when and what did it all mean? For a while, it seemed like every time one of us spent a shift at the hospital, we ended up with a different interpretation of what was being said. Again, we marveled at how other families without our capacity to band together, to communicate, and to be present with our mother ever survived this roller coaster ride. We worked closely with the caregivers and the administrators to keep, us ahead, keep as ahead of the game as we could. And through it all, we were astounded by our mother's resilience. She remained first and foremost in our minds. While we remembered how important self-care is for the caregivers, we made sure we took care of each other too. And when we saw a sibling getting too physically or emotionally drained, we would banish them from the hospital for a day or two and call in the reserves. 
My sister made a calendar and scheduled friends and family members who had offered to help out and take shifts. We hired Marilyn, a personal support worker with professional experience working in nursing homes and patients with dementia to bridge the gaps in scheduling. And her relationship with my mother has been nothing short of miraculous. I'll just tell you now off, off script that Marilyn, we still employ. My mother is now in a nursing home and we schedule Marilyn 30 hours a week to spend time with my mom because she is still cognizant enough to feel ill at ease in the, in the nursing home when she sees the um, immobility, the inability to communicate with many of the other patients. So Marilyn keeps her, we're so fortunate that my father <laughs> had a pension. Um, anyway, so we hired Marilyn. She brought with her experience and wisdom and strategies, strategies. At her urging, we fought our natural urge to treat our mother like a sick person in a hospital bed. And we began to bring routine back into her life. Because as Marilyn said, your mother isn't sick. She's healing. She needs stimulation. She needs activity. She needs music. She needs to get dressed in the morning. She needs her earrings. You see, that was truly a huge part of the decline in my mother's cognitive ability. She had been plucked from her cocoon, her house and property and from her existence within that environment which she had so carefully crafted as part of her natural survival instinct. Removing her from that safe haven had exposed her vulnerability and it had exposed our denial about our mother's illness. We put her name on the list of our top three choices of nursing homes and truly accepted the reality that mom could never live in our parents' home again. During our mother's continued recovery in the hospital, we heeded Marilyn's advice and tried our best to return some normalcy to our mother's life with regular routines. I brought in one of the Montessori activity kits from the Alzheimer's Society, and I realized I was still in denial about where my mother was in her state of mental health. In my mind, I thought, oh, she isn't at the stage yet where she's going to appreciate the textures and colors of a patchwork quilt lap blanket and a uh, coloring book of birds. They were her two favorite things. Yeah. Along with the jigsaw puzzles, which we are so grateful that now are too easy for her. Word searches, trivia games, they all contributed to where we are now, which is full-on Scrabble games where my mother does not want to settle for low-scoring words. Mom was scheduled to leave the hospital for a transitional convalescent stay at a nursing home until a room became available in one of the three facilities we'd we had agreed upon as a family for our mother's future residence. Now you have to understand, she went from living on her own, she couldn't even toilet herself. She couldn't remember how to pull up her diapers, which she had never worn before. That's how fast this happened to our family. <clears throat> she's not there anymore, she remembers now. She does, she, the nurses at the nursing home are amazed with how <clears throat> self-reliant she is. Anyway. So we were getting ready to move. We we're going to move her into this temporary convalescent. And we're thinking, oh, no, here we go. Oh, no. Then we've got to move her there and then move her somewhere else. This is going to be awful. On the same day we heard that a room would be available in five days for convalescent care, word arrived that she could move into a private room at Maple View Nursing Home in two days. Oh, we were thrilled. We had visions of mom doing her physiotherapy in the lovely rehab room on the fourth floor, enjoying the company of the others in the dining room joining in on social activities and benefiting from the comfort afforded with 24-hour care. The reality is that the transition has been heartbreaking. And the simple truth for me and my siblings is that nothing could have fully prepared us emotionally for the first time we had to leave our mother in her bedroom in a nursing home. No matter how lovely the facility, no matter how caring the staff, you just have to live it. But it helps to know that other people live that moment and many other moments like it over and over and over again. And they have survived. I think sharing those personal stories is so important for caregivers. Sharing the tragedies and the triumphs, continuing to cast the light on the shadows of dementia. My mother has changed. She cries now, 
She's impatient. She gets angry. And she is depressed. Her lack of a short-term memory leaves her constantly confused. Our family has a new reality. But as we continue on our journey, we are aware that we are creating new memories. And we cling to the moments that remind us that there is still peace to be found in the midst of this whirlwind. I think the hardest part for me is to see my mother struggling to make sense of something that doesn't make any sense. That although my mother doesn't remember what home was, she knows that it's not where she is now. The other difficult part is dealing with the lingering doubt of, what have we done? She asks us, why do I have to stay here? I hate it here. What is this jail? Why can't I move? Why can't I have an apartment? I just want to be me again. She knows something isn't right, but she can't figure out what it is. It's all a fog, she says all the time now. She says, it's right there. I know it's right there. I just can't see it. And she wants to know why God gave her Alzheimer's. She says, I never hurt God. And we know that as her caregivers, our role is to listen to her, to comfort her, to alleviate her fears, to make her feel safe, to validate her, and to reassure her that we are here we're not going anywhere, and she is loved. For a woman who has dedicated her entire adult life to doing exactly that for her entire family, that really isn't so much to ask. Thank you for listening. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very, very generous. I'm not sure I could do the rest of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> You'll but be all right. I thought for a second. Um, first off, are there any questions from the audience about Tim and his family's experience? And I, I want to start by thanking you on sharing that highly personal journey and your experience with us very vividly, Tim. Uh, are there any questions for Tim? Jocelyn? Mostly, any interaction we had with the, with the care staff was based on rehabilitation, medication, um, comfort, pain, pain relief. So there wasn't a lot of uh, talking about what we could do, uh, strategizing about her mental state. And, and I think because the medication had her so whacked out, I mean, there, there was really, I don't think there was anything that could have been done to help until we got her off those medications, you know. So um, it was really it was it was it was lovely care, but it wasn't about the mental. It was really about the physical. If that makes sense to you. Other questions for Tim? Yes, here. What was helpful? Oh, can I do karaoke? <laughs> 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 um, what What was helpful to you that staff did, and where could we, as frontline staff? improve how this transition works for you? Because uh, we, s we again see this over and over when people bring their family member to a facility and the adjustment it takes, but what could we do better to help you? 
Wow, gee, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, it, it, it's, it's impossible for this to happen, but it's almost like I wish the caregivers could have known who my mother was as a person. But how do you do that? How do you share that with somebody? How do you explain what she was like before? And that this is, we don't know who this person is. And, and that, I guess, is the crux of it is that it's how do you make a, 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 a professional caregiver understand what what life was like before and what we're hoping to achieve after because really we thought it was going to be knee surgery and then she'd get better and go home she we didn't see her as being in this, uh, such a state of dementia that she couldn't take care of herself in her own home so it came at us so fast and furious we weren't even prepared to explain <laughs> so i don't i don't know that i really have an answer other than it, it, it tell uh, maybe just talking to the family saying what did she like what did she do what activities how did she how was she in her own home I mean those kinds of things but does that help the care you can give her I don't know it maybe gives you more insight into the person but we have a, a question from Linda um, just to respond to oh. that, when my grandmother, she wasn't going through Alzheimer's, but um, she was person. in an Oh, old hi, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> That's me <laughs> sitting down. Just look. Um, she wasn't going through Alzheimer's, but she was in an old age home, and a similar situation occurred where I got very frustrated at how she was being treated. Like, she just didn't have a brain, and she just couldn't express herself well, and being first-generation Japanese-Canadian. So what I did was I brought a series of pictures in, you know, 40 years ago, because she was a beautiful samurai woman, and uh, several pictures of one of her with that I blew up, like, you know, 40 feet by 40 feet kind of thing. But then also, not quite, but also other pictures of her with her family and at work at, at, the, Nap at the old age home at Napoleon home. So um, that was one thing I d I we, we did with her and for her. But the second thing is, I don't know if you've ever considered writing, but um, you should kind of write an article or a wee little booklet called... Um, Oh, I had it at the tip of my tongue. And she wasn't wearing her earrings. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, do we have two minutes left, two or three minutes? Um, what I want to do, there's a question over here. And there and there. From Lou. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having fun. Don't talk, don't stop me now. <laughs> I'm on a roll, Ken, leave me alone. <laughs> I, I work in the room, baby, come on. Thank you for that. Uh, I appreciated that so much. I think in the work that I do, um, I always said that you have to know the person. This is essential to giving care. You have to know the person. And what I find the most challenging of all is communicating to that to all the staff. So there are so many people. There's such a turnover of yes. staff. PSWs, they said to me, well, I'm only watching during break, or I don't know this person, or this is my first shift with the person. Yes. So I put a know the person up on the wall. but probably the most difficult. In a long-term care setting, it's able to do it because people are stable and staying there for a long time. But in the acute care setting, it's something I struggle with all the time. I gather all this information, and I know the person, and I don't know how to share it. And that is very, very true. When we saw, when we saw a nurse come into the room that had worked with my mom before, we were like, yay, it's her again, yay, we love her. She knows mom, right? Because, and then some of the, and some of the younger nurses really just, w like, wouldn't even know. I mean, they just look at the, ch and there was, the charts were, I don't think that, I don't think the charts said enough about what was going on with her. <laughs> I don't think the nurses got enough information about, is that awful to say that? <laughs> A place to put that information? Yeah. And then we were, like, and the nurses all said, you guys are like a model family, oh my gosh, because we would share the information with the new nurses and tell them, well, this is what happened the last time, and this is what the doctor, and this doctor said that, and that doctor, and how many doctors, like we saw three different doctors, and oh, uh, and then not to have a doctor with hospital privileges, oh man, that is so hard too, because, you know, when she went in there, I mean, just, how does that, I guess she just happened to be there, and she went in to visit my mom and saw that something happened, and she found a doctor, I don't even know, like, she settled it somehow, but. Thank you very much for your discussion. Um, we just wanted to talk about, we're here from Norfolk General and uh, we just recently had uh, implemented gentle persuasive approaches education at our site. 
And we took one of the um, previous personhood exercises, which really gets to knowing the person as an individual, not just as a diagnosis or condition. So our project, and for this um, proposal process, is to not only just ask all of our seniors, but every patient coming into our hospital, it's called personal print exercise, in which um, within the 24 hours of admission, there's a dialogue between caregiver, patient, family member, if the person can't sort of speak on behalf of themselves. We ask them two questions. Write things that you would like to know, uh, for us to know about you in the fingers, okay? So, you know, uh, love gardening, I was an architect, you know, anything sort of from their perspective. And also, most importantly, tell us what is important to you while you're in the hospital. The intention is that everyone has that done within 24 hours of admission, and it's posted on the whiteboard. So if I'm coming in to clean the room, or if I'm coming in as a physician or a nurse, that everybody knows a bit more about that person with their permission. So. Right, that's a good strategy. So I think we're winding down to the last couple minutes. There's one more question. Hi, this Hi. is really timely for me. Um, my aunt passed last week. Uh, my aunt was a, a maiden woman who had lived a very long life teaching and serving others with no children. And so it was nieces and nephews that were her caregivers. Yes. And I think I, I think I must thank my nursing instructors from years ago who always told me that inside that decrepit little shell of a person, there is a gem and you need to go digging and find who that gem is. I think I encourage all of you because at this very moment, you and I are aging at the same speed and we are going to be that person's, you know, like 65 and over is going to be the norm and that um, let it not be said that nobody knew you until your funeral. Um, there were things we found out about our aunt because we weren't with her all the time that we found out at the funeral. So I think that thing that I was taught in nursing was when I sit down and start an IV on somebody, I hold those hands and I say, what have these hands done in your life? And tell me your story. And I just thank you for being here today and telling your story. Well, thank you. Um, what, oh yeah. <laughs> um, you were talking about um, sharing the stories, right? And that's something else that now, it, it, that's why I included the part about my, my mother, who she was, about her history. Because that, when you, when you know who she was, what a, an amazing, down-to-earth person, so unaffected by all the stuff that could have made her, you know, snotty or whatever. She was just the nicest lady and funny and all of those things. Those, I put those stories in this just because that, I think, is the key to all of this is just it's a person, right? There's a history. There's a life. There's a lifetime in there. And the other difficult thing, I think, for seniors, how many doctors do people who live to be 90 years old go through in their lifetimes? And how sad was it that at one point, see, because my father had been a judge in Sudbury, so they had their doctor in Sudbury. They had great doctors there. That's who my mother worked with when he went through the, all the brain tumors and stuff, the brain surgery. <clears throat> so then they moved to Sault Ste. Marie, and they have to find a new doctor. And they did. They were orphaned for a while, but they got one. And then he retired because they keep outliving everybody, right? So now he's retired, and she's, now my mother is a widow. She's 80, whatever she was, I think, at the time. She was in her 80s, and she was orphaned. She didn't have a doctor until this other doctor started up a practice and took my mother on. But that's just, how do you end up being an 80-year-old woman and not have a family doctor? And then you get a new one, and they just don't, the whole, you know what I mean? It's once again, the person. They don't know who that person was. She's not, anyway, you, you, I understand what I'm saying, and you know this already. I'm preaching to the choir. But it's, how do, you, how do we take all of those things into consideration and give these people the, the, the love that they deserve. 